right. Uh, so everyone, welcome. So this is PBALA Five Plus Years in Reflecting on the Practice Part Two. Our presenter is Beth uh, Burdell. Just a second here. Um, all right. Um, so I'll just start like this. Um, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Tesla Ontario series. My name is Brittany Hack, and I will be your host today. Um, I will help with discussion engagement for tonight. Um, our moderator is Raquel Borney, and she will be providing tech support as well as keeping a close eye on communication provided through texts in tonight's discussion. We encourage feedback from our members, both positive and negative, on the question topics selected. Please be advised that these discussions are recorded on our YouTube website. The organization simply asks that we keep the discussion professional, language appropriate, and on topic. With this in mind, let us introduce our presenter. So, Beth Verdell began teaching English in the Link ESL program in the fall of 2016 during the implementation of PBLA. As an, a naturally nurturing person with interpersonal and intrapersonal intelligence, she has been striving to use assessments for learning in the context of PBLA to create a more holistic approach to provide English instruction, practice, and assessment. In 2021, she completed a Master's of Adult Education through uh, Yorkville University with a focus on building a learning community in the English for Literacy Learner Classroom for her capstone. All right, so the agenda for tonight. For those who are new to TESOL Ontario Dialogue series, each presentation consists of agenda questions. For this presentation, we will start with two introductory questions, three conversation and discussion questions, and end with one breakout room activity at the last hour of the session. The breakout room activity is intended for participants to share ideas with each other through discussion. We encourage everyone to participate since it's a good opportunity for our community to interact as well as network. All right, so we have this little um, definition here. Uh, this is from Peck, uh, 1978 American uh, psychiatrist and author of The Road uh, Less Traveled on what is a community uh, in this way. So a group of individuals who have learned how to communicate honestly with each other, whose relationship goes deeper than their masks of composure, and who have developed some significant commitment to rejoice together, mourn together, and to delight in each other and make other condi uh, conditions our own. And this is as cited by Hooks 20, uh, uh, 21, page 129. Uh, All right. So before we begin tonight's dialogue session, um, I will uh, quickly explain the typical method of interaction that we use to get the best discussion from our online engagement. Um, I will read to you the question, then offer the opportunity for the presenter to provide their answer. Once they are done discussing what they would like to say, uh, the presenter will offer the question to the rest of you. Uh, use your raised hand button if you would like to speak. Um, our moderator will also be keeping track of the text dialog box. You may type those responses in, um, and either myself or the moderator can bring those to the attention of the discussion. Be aware that our moderator has the privilege to stop the discussion in the event that we start going past the allocated time limit. It might be good to signal with a few hand gestures if uh, we start hitting those time limits, um, but I will leave that up to the discretion of the moderator. Um, if the discussion appears a bit quiet, I can provide some insight into the instructional uh, design uh, world of ESL, uh, but only at the request of the presenter and the participants. Um, so I refuse to hog the space. Uh, lastly, in the event that anyone is having technical issues at the time of the session, you can send a text to the moderator and they will do their best to address it. You may also send any questions or comments that you have about tonight's uh, session to the moderator or myself as well. Uh, so if everyone can give me a thumbs up or type yes in the dialog box, that this format makes sense, that would be great. 
Now, if you are not sure, uh, you can follow along and see what other uh, participants are doing. If you see that a neighbor or a friend has attended, don't be afraid to give them a little poke, uh, aka a private text to ask questions. So let's begin. Okay, introductory question. Here's the first one. Has PDLA implementation affected the relationship between management and instructors in your program? How have you seen the shift over the last few years? Beth. Okay, thanks. Um, so I just wanted to say, um, I don't really feel like I'm the expert here at all. I'm just another instructor um, trying to figure it all out like all of us. So um, I don't like that expert term, but um, thanks anyway. So it's nice to see everybody or see everybody's names anyway. And um, I hope that we have a really good um, and dialogue here together today. Uh, so yeah, I, as I mentioned, I only began during the implementation of PBLA. So I don't really have a lot of experience prior um, with that sort of management instructor relationship. Um, but um, I feel like this is more of a, so, yeah, so I, if you can just say yes or no in the chat box, that would be great. And then if anyone just sort of wants to give us a share, like a brief example, obviously no names or locations, but um, that would be great too if anyone wants to share their thoughts on this. Or if you just want to say yes, 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 no, no, whatever. Navdeep says yes. I'm not sure if that yes was for this question or for the other question, but. The reason that I um, put this question up, I don't want to, you know, get anyone in trouble here, but somebody in the chat last time said that it would they would like to have had this um, included, so. Oh, okay, Navdeep, thanks. <laughs> So even if you just want to say yes or no, chats aren't recorded anywhere. Everybody's very shy. Okay, I will chime in. Um, so um, when it comes to uh, leadership, and it's not just with the PBLA, but I think this follows for everyone with that managerial and um, employee relationship, right? I've noticed quite a bit of changes with managerial style. Um, so um, this might be something uh, to reflect on. I can't say what has happened in the past because uh, when I started teaching, it was relatively recent, um, but I have found, uh, especially now that the management style has become to the point where um, management almost has to let go a little bit and provide a little bit uh, more um, control um, and almost like trust towards the, uh, in, in this case, we'll call them the instructors. Um, mm -hmm. And I think because the world is so busy with mm -hmm. everything that's going on, it makes it very difficult for one person to try to do everything and I think we've seen this in all fields where mm -hmm. um, management has had to somewhat step aside um, because there's there's just too much and it, it's different ways of of having that relationship um, I was actually uh, watching something from I don't know if anyone knows this individual his name's uh, Jocko uh, Wilnick and he's a critical, uh, he does critical leadership training as a former Navy SEALs officer. And so one of the things he was talking about was management 101. And he said, these are some of the things that you will need. So to be humble, uh, listen and take input, collaborate um, uh, and formulate a plan, execute, execute rapidly by taking small steps and the most important thing was communicating the why. Why are we doing this? Why are we moving in that direction, right? 
Um, and then he talked about how to build a team. Uh, he said, uh, leaders always complain about these things like with their employees, and it could be similar to, to instructors, right? Uh, people not willing to do the work. Uh, people are not uh, passionate about what their role is and, uh, and what the mission is, right? Um, and so then when he was talking to these managers, they were saying how difficult it is for the individuals that they have, right? That are on their team and it's hard to do things, right? And he's like, huh, you think that you have it tough? He said, I will tell you who the most difficult worker is. And this is what his answer was. He said, the draftees in the army or Marine Corps in Vietnam. And he gave three reasons. He said, they don't want to do that job. They are uh, completely against the mission and the job and actual mission can get them killed, right? I don't think we're seeing that in as being an instructor where we have a risk that something like that can happen, right? And so for anyone, say, who's in a management position, um, this might be things that they, they may want to consider, they want to think about, and this idea of, you know what, when things are all over the place, right, and other people have ideas that they want to bring in, maybe I need to let go a little bit, right? Um, so hopefully that's opened up some ideas with the discussion. Does anyone have anything else that they would uh, like to bring? It, this is really just a, a general um, component of, of the, the managerial re relationship between employees. Anyone else out there? <laughs> All right. Well, can I please. unmute? Yes, yes please. please. <laughs> Okay, so I've just parked in my driveway. It's the first time I've ever tried to get into Zoom on, on my phone. So now I know how my students feel. But I'm surprised. I can use the chat. I can talk to you. Oh, but I forgot we're using Teams now, and that's more complicated. Anyway, thank you for the question. But I actually didn't think about it. PBLA started off, and the leads were the experts. And they <laughs> signed up. They sidelined the administration. It was like admin, we're taking over here, and they became the de facto um, uh, arbiters of what should be in in uh, portfolios, etc. And admin was kind of like flummox because they hadn't had training. Suddenly, then the lead thing became because it was very problematic. It was so divisive. The lead trained the trainer. Suddenly, the leads sort of disappeared. Mm -hmm. um, they there's some people who actually still, you know, ins have a binding ins binder inspection. And then admin was forced to take on the role of being the PBLA implementers. Plus, they had very heavy um, pressure from, from uh, funders that if they didn't do the PBLA and now Avenue, uh, young, um, funding would be f yanked. So I think they must have been under, and I've never thought of it from their point of view until this moment, they must have been under a great deal of pressure because already some of them had already themselves said, okay, it's not working, it's not good. They were hearing from us the criticisms. So I think that men suddenly had to come on board and they do have a lot of problems with um, keeping the relationships with us going, you know, the support friendly, but of course... Uh, authoritative not authoritarian and then the pressure to implement and approve and so the relationship changed with my management from being very very close we were very very close man mm -hmm. we'd had management never actually took on again that same role and they became de facto implementers which doesn't make them very comfortable i think <laughs> I mean, you know, they didn't really know what they were implementing. So I, that's the only thing I'd like to contribute right at this moment, a sudden feeling of a little bit of sympathy for admin. So I guess my question is because it sounds like you have experience from the past and to the present. And with that change, have you seen improvement? or has it Oh, good God, no. No, it sounds no, like no, no, it's no. gotten no, worse. It's no improvement, worse. no improvement. It's, it's even more confusing and, um, you know, uh, nonsensical and, and, and go by the, uh, but it's, it's, it's lost 
you know, in the beginning, I think we all came on board thinking um, portfolios. Okay, I've always kept folders. Portfolios seems like a good idea. When we discovered what it was, the prescriptive, um, mm -hmm. and it was not assessment of learning. It was immediately a, 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 a assessment for learning. It was immediately summative. Every every test was summative, summative, summative. And um, so I think that uh, there were lots of horrible relationships with um, leads and there are some leads who will go down in history as being extremely sadistic and nasty and uh, um, last week at last oh, time yeah. I was so um, I, I was overwhelmed to hear saying about yeah I was one of those uh, one of those teachers who was out on sick leave because of the stress mm -hmm. so at least with an admin, you know who they are, their management. And so they, 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 it became logical because what were the uh, leads? They were our colleagues who suddenly became the champions, which made us just chop meat, right? And yeah. so admin made it logical that they were managers, but they didn't know about the nitty gritty. And so, you know, they would go according to some checklists of what's in the binders and how you're supposed to do it and you're not doing this and you're not doing that. But the most important thing was they were getting all this pressure, still do, from funders. And I, I suddenly feel a little bit of compassion, <laughs> but, 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 but basically for the people that I care about, um, for, for their role. The role has changed for admin. They were before just the people who made sure that the binders were unpacked or whatever. You know, they, 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 they didn't have hands-on involvement in PBLA. And now they sort of do, but they don't because they don't, they don't have, they're not teachers. That's the change. Thank you for that. Um, teachers used to be, you know, the, the admin used to be, you were a teacher after a certain amount of time, you got seconded to be a manager. And today, I think there are lots of teacher of, of admin that have had very little experience, especially in Link. Maybe they've had experience in uh, visa schools. Anyway, yeah. that's, that's for me at the moment. Definitely a change and not for the better. And PBLA yeah. is much more um, ragged at the edges than it ever was. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And from what you're describing, it sounds like the communication piece was... Um, very um, weak, right? And that component of why, why are we doing these things? What's coming out of that, right? That's so important to communicate with your team. If they understand what's going on, if they understand the complexity of things, it, it helps with how everyone functions together on a team. I, I've worked with teams that were very strong. I've worked with teams that were very weak in different industries. And there's a huge, huge difference between that. You get way more done when everyone's kind of on the, the same wavelength. Or if you have um, people, and so in this case, it would have been um, the draftees that came in that are giving you that input and saying, no, we think this is a terrible idea that you're doing. You're going to end up, you know, so the, the uh, in this case, the colonel who is responsible of them, they have to be taking that stuff into consideration because what it does is it makes um, the management team better leaders, right? And you can learn so much from the people that you're involved with, especially those that are not happy with what's going on because it, it, you're growing together. Like both sides. I mean, if I can just jump in again, that uh, it was PBLA, there was never any dialogue. There was always, if you um, tried to talk truth to power, it was always your In the original days of the train the trainer and the change cycle, there was actually a diagram that, that showed the resistance, the older, older teachers, they're going to resist. And, and then it was, if it get, they get really bad and they don't, you know, you don't, you explain to them and they don't cover. And at the end, there was this thing, they may have to be fired. And so it was always under the threat of, if you don't do this, you're going to get fired. I don't know if anybody remembers those days, but I mean, it was so different. I mean, I did, um, um, what's, TDSB's uh, courts on and at least with courts on you know they, they opened up a dialogue what do you think please give us feedback with PBLA there was zero don't give us any feedback unless it's positive 
And um, I think that exists still to this day, which is, you know, that's what other people feel. The state mm -hmm. of the, the program right now for PBLA because of that. So, but anyway. Does anyone, anyone else has any thoughts? Before. Anyone else? Any right. admin here? <laughs> yeah, I was wondering. I, I have an admin background. I, I have. A, she, I think she meant just um, okay. that works in yeah. the program. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. And, and yeah. fair enough. I, I've done for other things, but. Um, yeah, I have too. Yeah. Um, and I, I do have a teaching background and an ed tech background. So I wear, I wear multiple hats. But anyways, I'm going to move to the next question. Um, all right. <clears throat> Has your program been moving away from the assessment tasks and encouraging more skill using tasks to add to the binder? Share your thoughts. So um, this is a question because I, I, I found in the two, two places where I work that this year, the skill using was sort of a focus of one of the PDs that um, was done. And um, I've heard other people also talk about how this is happening. Um, and I think that it's, well, I think it's because the government um, funders, um, PBLA is not working out the way they intended or expected it to. And I think that um, they wanted to have this PBLA created to, I think they did it to, to try to move people quickly through this system and show you know, numbers, you know, and account for the funding through, oh, look how many successful uh, graduates we have here sort of thing. And I don't think it worked that way. So um, I think that they forgot the, the human element um, and they lacked foresight into the different cultural and experiential, experiential differences that people have that are new immigrants. Um, so... But I was thinking also, I think this, I don't know what you think, but I think this could be an opportunity for instructors to kind of try to take back, you know, the classroom, so to speak, um, by, you know, hopefully, I mean, how could we uh, help the students to refocus from away from numbers to more uh, feedback and thinking about the feedback, these tasks as a way to look at your learning and um, see where you need to still work more. I don't know about you, but I, th I think that it's an opportunity to do that. As well, especially if um, we're not like giving them even a pass fail, right? There's no grade, it's just feedback. And then during conferencing, we're looking together at the tasks and other things and our observations and able to make a real assessment about the student and help them see where they're at as well. So I'll throw it out to you all. What do you think? Hey, Daryl. Hello, Claudie. May I have a, may I make uh, some comments? Yes, I'd love that. Okay. Um, just speaking about this. Well, firstly, when at its inception, when we attended countless sessions, three, four, five hours, um, we were not supposed to offer opinions. This was, this was blind, and I say this with the greatest respect for the managers who were fantastic. In some cases, there were people who were following the law to the letter. So in other words, they were following everything. If suggestions were given, they were shot down. So what I want to say is, in the style of Japanese management, um, perhaps when you are leading a group, you feel slightly elevated. Perhaps if you come down a little and you invite participation from your audience, break them up into groups, you might find that even from the little gray people sitting at the back whom you're ignoring, perhaps, you will find the most wonderful suggestions because I think all of us have seen that in our classrooms. This also extends to PBLA. So if you're teaching level four, level five, um, 
remember it's it's multi-level classes so if i go from level six seven right all the way to nine and then i extend it to general IELTS. i'm talking about texts you yeah. could use that but in many cases you are told you cannot do that it doesn't fit into the category and i think it all comes down to maybe many people including myself becoming absolutely familiar and testing the water in your classroom because many of our students have probably got a lot more knowledge one one of my students from turkey was actually at the university of toronto she was in level four she gave the most superb lecture my my daughter speaks turkish my one daughter we went along what i'm saying is it's also a matter of labeling allow more participation between management and pupils there are managers whom i know and respect greatly who allow that also let the students when you give a topic let them organize themselves give them a text and tell them and then let them organize it by breaking up into little groups they could many of them will do the most superb work so what i'm saying is it's too rigid and mm -hmm. i think it takes time at its inception we just have to be have to respect it but also allow for more flexibility between the between management and pupil and students it, do you know what i'm saying do you understand what i mean yeah no, that makes sense um it, it's like uh, you're giving them an opportunity can i to... can i jump in here because yeah. i agree with him that you'll be be flexible sure. be, but but that's outside the, the the bounds of pbla pbla is so <laughs> to um skill building skill using and ats or tas depending where you live you know some people say task assessment some people say assessment so in the old accusation used to be the teachers are only doing grammar and uh, it's not true but but that was the accusation so anything that smacked of you know classroom what was it ppp presentation practice per um production Prepare. yeah it was like no 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 we not we don't do that with pbla so the reality was though the numbers the numbers were the numbers of tests now it you have to teach before you can test that's dr mendelson it's a long time you have to teach before you test so it was impossible to teach and then to test because you never got anything done. And so basically then they said, okay, if you have something that looks a little bit like a test, we'll call it a skill using. And I remember, I think it was Shirley Graham, Tesla Ontario, there were these discussions about the acceptable because it's really supposed to be blah, 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 rubric, blah, blah, blah. Oh, rubrics, for God's sake. You know, like hundreds of years making all the stuff which goes into a binder, which they've never seen and is so redundant. But I think the skill using skill bind the uh, skill uh, sorry this yeah the skill using at least opened up a way for teachers um, Beth to be a little bit more as they used to we uh, we talked about it last yeah, time yeah that's what um, I'm what saying do we, yeah what do we do today we do exactly what we did before yeah and we do PLA but we kind of try to you know bridge the two things because we can't teach any other way than the way we know is right and PBLA is wrong but we have to do it. So Kind of find this way. The skill using gave us at least an opportunity yeah. to use things that worked so fast. Perhaps the sort of production thing of the PP. Yeah. Um, exactly. So it wasn't a bad thing that it came, but it's not the solution. Sorry. Well, I'm not saying, well, of course it's not the solution, but it's what we have. How can we work with it and make it our own? saying okay i don't even care if it's pbla or not whatever that's not my concern it's i want to make this um use this as the practice or the production i, I mean and um we're gonna stick to this it in the binder um it's gonna get feedback but not a grade you know i'm thinking of how uh, you know everyone talks about the you know not all students but some students are like you know, when do I get my, wh when is the assessment? Why didn't you give me a four? You know, I want fours. I need four fours, whatever. Um, and so to try to help the students to refocus on the learning <laughs> rather than the, re you know, the that test that they want. Mm -hmm. So that I'm, I'm saying, is this an opportunity for us to kind of take that back? 
Hmm. What do you think? Anybody? It's interesting because some some programs seem to be saying now a hundred percent of them can be skill using, and some are saying no, no it's uh, sixty. Others fifty fifty. So and so I don't know about um, what are your programs saying about the numbers too. <laughs> Just curiously, please put your answers in the chat box. <laughs> it would be great. This is a dialogue, so we want you know engagement here. I think at this point, um, okay. Oh, the Joseph says the magic number is thirty-two. <laughs> every month. Oh, every month. Yeah. Sorry, I, you're probably supposed to read them, not me. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. It's fine. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what four is using. Every month, four skill using and two oh, assessment sorry. tasks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Every month. Okay. So they have. Okay. Yeah. Bodas. Okay. Um, I think what we'll do because um, the I did hear from the moderator, so I think we're going to move on to the next question. Okay. okay. Sounds good. That? Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay. So now we're moving on to conversation and discussion questions. Um, do you, you have a habit of reflecting on your own practice? Please share some ideas on how you do this. Okay. So. Um, I thought we could move into, um, I wanted, before we go into the issue of re, uh, doing reflections with students, I thought we could talk about our own reflections on our own practice. Um, so um, my answer here would be that, um, well, when I start first started, I would, um, you know, I would write my lessons out, of course, and then I would make notes and reflect upon how the lesson went afterwards. Um, but now I don't write and I don't journal either, although I would love to say I do. <laughs> I, I don't really journal. Um, so I just, been, I'm, what now I, what I do is I do it in my head as I'm teaching even and I, if I notice um, something's not working, then I'll redirect my style or my methods. And so I'm kind of doing it on an ongoing basis, I feel, as far as the classroom day-to-day -day goes. Um, another way is um, having discussions with colleagues is really helpful. You know, it's sort of like somebody that can, um, is a mirror for you and can maybe see things that you're not noticing to help you improve your practice. And then finally, um, I think that uh, getting feedback from the students I feel like it has to be anonymous feedback, otherwise they might feel intimidated or, you know, not want to answer truthfully. So get, getting anonymous feedback from the students um, and then n not leaving it there, but then bringing that, reading it and then bring it, bringing it back into a discussion with the class after. Um, I think that's a really good also way to build good rapport with the students as well and trust in your class. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like have the students involved in your uh, reflection and have yourself involved. Maybe go back to your lesson plan and circle those parts that were missing or were not going well. Um, try to have your students do weekly reflections just to make sure that, you know, your lesson is very, it's a, was a good lesson and, mm -hmm. I did what I needed to do. Did the students do what they needed to do? So, yeah. yeah. Our moderator added something very nice. Um, and I think this is very good. Uh, might be useful to occasionally record yourself teaching audio and video preferably. It provides an unbiased way of seeing what you do and aid in reflecting on your practices. Um, and there's also another comment here, anonymous feedback uh, sounds like a good idea. Oh, here's another one. I asked learners first feedback about class, what they liked the most, the least, suggestions for change. Um, oh, this is a good one too. Exit tickets can be good reflections. Students can go back to the lesson goals and see if they were met. 
Yeah, and Claudia, um, that um, that brings to mind the idea of that um, paper, the idea of folding the paper in three and put um, stop, start, and um, continue, right? And then you give it to them, and then they, I've done that one as well, and then they hand it in, and it can be an anonymous also. You know, you don't, they don't have to put their name on it, and then you can go through and see what things they're tired of. <laughs> Maybe you're doing something really annoying oh, and then what they would like you to start doing and continue. So that's a good one too. Oh, another way to analyze your teaching can, can be to see the those engagement in the class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. That's very good, especially with motivation. Uh, one thing I like doing is seeing if I can find um, technological solutions that are attractive because motivation can be hard sometimes, especially if it's motivation that helps with memory retention, right? Consider some of our learners, right, that are, um, say, 55 and up, right? Some of these skills may be very difficult uh, for them to um, achieve, right? And so as adults, we like finding patterns and how we learn things, right? And if they find something that they like, then more than likely to uh, uh, stick with that and want to continue um, learning. So I'm, I'm always looking for mm -hmm. those little nuggets. Yeah. All right, shall we move on to the next question? Sure, any unless questions? anyone, any last comments? <laughs> Right. Just one comment. Yeah. Right. May I just make one comment? Sure. Yes. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, it there's so many factors involved in creating a dynamic classroom. And over the weeks, one gets to know it's almost automatic pilot. Mm -hmm. But also knowing what going inward. Um, I want to quote a colleague who passed away a few years ago and did a PhD on this, Empathy in the Classroom by Dr. Mm -hmm. Sheila Cook, a superb teacher, and we were her guinea pigs. Mm -hmm. In other words, each person has a different modus operandi for learning. And then if we go in and we think of ourselves, how do we learn? How did we retain things in the past? How do we retain it now? And in many of these old ways can be adapted and they still work. One of which is repetition, rote learning. You know, the cup, the empty cup. And later when you get old, you, you've got the basis and then you fill it as you get older. But mm -hmm. uh, an inspector told me once, I was very nervous when I started teaching. He finished the class being in my classroom for five hours. And he said to me, I have something to ask you. I said, what is it, sir? He said, well, how do you know whether your, whether your lesson was successful? And I hummed and hard and I was going to think of something very intelligent to say and I couldn't. I said, well, could you please tell me what it is? He said, watch their faces as they leave the classroom. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure all of you have thought of that. And the other one is that if that we always know whether we reached our students and how do we know? Because there's a very famous saying, which I'm sure everybody knows in, in other languages, the mirror never lies. If I go home and I look in the mirror and I say, did you give a good lesson? <laughs> the face in the mirror will tell me it was terrible. <laughs> the next day, the sun is shining. How was it? The wind was at your back. So what I'm saying is you can simplify, but often it just comes down to basics and knowing your students and letting them participate more and be more creative. And if anybody's interested, mm -hmm. read The Robber's Cave, the famous psychological exercise about groups, putting people into groups and mm -hmm. what happened afterwards. So uh, really, this is such a wonderful profession, but it's, it's got so many sides that it can be very, let's see, I've got, I've got something big in my small classroom um, CLB 5, 6. It's daunting when you look at it the first time. But if you think about it and how we study and retain things, it's, 
it's not that difficult as long as everybody participates. Anyway, I've broken the rule of 70-30 and I apologize. I'll talk too much. <laughs> not at all. All right, we'll move on to the next question. Reflective activities can be very trying, especially if literacy, oh, sorry, for literacy and lower levels. What tip do you have for incorporating student self-reflection and or peer-to-peer -peer feedback practices? Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna, gonna oh, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, no, go ahead, please. No, I can talk okay. after you. I can talk after you, go ahead. Okay, so I think reflective activities in general um, are very, um, are very good in a way to measure how the learning is going on in the class, what's happening. Um, mm -hmm. But I also think in tips for incorporating self-reflective and peer-to-peer -peer feedback, a uh, tip I would give is, um, is when students do like skill using activities or even assessment tasks, like presentations, um, and students can obviously self-assess themselves as well, right? Uh, certainly self-assess themselves, um, have students ask them, P ask, have their peers answer questions based on the presentation, do a peer feedback chart, um, get into a discussion with other peers and see how, you know, for some, some good feedback practices. Oh, good, thanks. And yeah. I, I was going to talk a little bit first about the literacy and lower levels. So, I was having this discussion with um, this question came up with um, one of my colleagues, Lisa, and um, she's been teaching for 30 years or more maybe. And so I, I really loved her example and I really kind of want to start using it. But she said that um, she starts with, so it's, you know, for the, it's the cognitive or the metacognitive practice of self-reflection is, um, can be a little bit difficult. So she starts with um, very concrete examples in their own day-to-day -day life and in their past, own past experiences. Like, um, <clears throat> you know, if they're doing something with food, she might ask, um, who taught you to cook? So then, you know, they're thinking about how, they learned to cook, who, who was involved, and the process of how they learned. So you can start with very day-to-day -day experiences like that. Um, you could do it with anything else, too. Um, who taught you how to tie your shoes or who taught you how to drive or whatever, right? Um, and then as, as they get more comfortable with that, you could... Um, eventually move to um, the more abstract or cognitive classroom learning um, self-reflection. Um, so you could like, even ask, how, how did you learn to read if, if they're um, just lower levels? And um, how do you like to learn even as they get more progressed? Um, then finally, you can move into the more specific skills uh, that are might be related to the tasks you're given, giving. So, um, and then you could spiral it up and down, right? And just continue with going from very foundational or or day to day experiences to the more higher, you know, metacognitive type of reflections. Anyone else? It's just like I can see something here. Okay. Ooh, long answer, but it's good. Yeah. Um, I don't do peer to peer feedback generally, but at end of month, I give them, as in level six and seven, a questionnaire, approximately 25 items. Did you learn more or less than you expected this month? Which skill improved the most, the least? How do you know this? What are you planning to, uh, I think, work. learn uh, next month? Work um, on, yeah. Oh, sorry, work. Oh, my apology. So what are you planning to work on next week? If less, why? That's very interesting. Yeah, I like that. And that, that sounds very appropriate for that level. Yes, but I can for sure. Where the, the challenge would be with lower levels. Yes, right? yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Because they really, if you go in and, and um, so I teach CLB one and two pl with literacy students in, in there too. So mm -hmm. if you go in and bring in a reflection on learning, um, they're like, what? I don't <laughs> understand. They're, they have, you know, they really don't. And then you just kind of, you can just walk through it with them with the um yeah. on the overhead and just fill it out together if you've just finished mm -hmm. something that you want them to think about how 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 much better can you order coffee now than you could before or whatever yeah. it is yeah um I, another foundation? one i've done pardon have you had foundation level i have taught yeah. foundation level in, before yes it's yeah tricky. yeah um, Very honestly, I have not tried to do <laughs> reflections at that stage, but I think that Lisa's idea of just talking about their their own day to day experiences and how they're learning this or that or how they have learned to cook, for example, is a great way to yes. engage in that for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, Another one I was I was going to mention is um, I I read this in a Stephen Brookfield book the the skillful teacher it's called and um, it's called Chalk Talk and I've done this with um, higher level I had a seven to nine class once and um, so what you do is you um, put a question on the white on the board whether it's a blackboard or whiteboard and then um, or your Google document or whatever it is. And um, we were doing, um, for example, uh, a theme of lifelong learning or adult learning. And um, so I, you write the question on the board and then circle it. It's in the middle of the board. And then I, so I did, how do you learn best? And then you place several markers um, on the, along the board. And then as they are thinking, they can think and take some time to think about that. And then they come up and write. And everybody can come up as they will and write what they want. Um, and then um, you, you explain that it's okay if several people write the same thing. That's okay. And that they can also even respond to what somebody else has said. So if somebody says something that ignites their interest, they can ask a question or they can further that idea with that, their own response. And um, then also the teacher is going in and making questions or responses and connecting ideas together on the board with a line. And then afterwards, after it's all finished, um, just, you know, have a discussion about it and get their thoughts. All right. I'm just going to uh, bring this in because there, there is an um, individual who's having technical issues, which has a oh. very good question. And it's this. My main oh. question is, if you or those present think that the dialogue needs to include those who continue to insist that PBLA must be the way to teach and learn in Lake. Sorry, I don't see the question. Oh, oh I see it. Okay, so I she's, this is from yes. Yulia. Yes. Yulia. Uh, My main teach? question is yes. if you doesn't think that this dialogue needs to include those who continue to insist that PBLA must be the way. I think it, so I agree. I think that it, I'm sad that it doesn't, you know, it was an open invitation really for anyone that knows about it. Um, mm -hmm. So um, how can we engage the decision makers in a real conversation that considers experience of practitioners? Yeah, it's a good question. I know, and I've, yeah, I know you've been trying to do that right. with a few and results, so. Sorry, the, the other uh, part to her oh. question, how can we engage the decision makers in real conversation that considers experiences of practitioners, something I've been trying to do with few results? Would Tesla Ontario be willing to speak up on behalf of the membership? That's a very good question. Yeah. That's, I've always, I've kind of often wondered that too, like, I know it's, you know, a separate entity, but, um, you know, we're their members and struggling <laughs> at times with this, so. Mm -hmm. um, also, Beth, uh, Yulia would also like to connect with you, so she's left her contact information. Yeah, Yulia. okay. 
Thanks. Yeah. I'm going to try to grab that if I can. Ah, and our moderator has added something. So a possible oh. topic to explore at the Tesla Ontario conference when the dis uh, decision makers will be present. So that could be a good venue to bring that. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it conference. could be. Yeah, so that's an idea. Yeah, that, that's true. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, um, let's move to... The next question. Here we are. Thanks, Julia, <laughs> for that. Those comments, by the way. <laughs> yes. Sorry. <laughs> I apologize. No, sorry. How can we mitigate the difficulties that can arise because of the revolving door known as continuous intake? Does your program have a process that is helpful in this respect? What would be helpful besides not having it? Oh yeah. So this is uh, one of the. This has been on in the link program, I guess, for since the start. I'm not sure, but um, so it's not like this is a new thing, of course. But I think that PBLA really exacerbated this, uh, or it just made it really bad um, because of the way PBLA is set up. So um, I would, I, I really think this is totally a manager issue that could be resolved if there were even just a few like um like a scheduled day for example if if there could be okay every um when new students enroll they'll start on the mondays right so that you know there's more the instructors and the other students are um have more of a an awareness that that the on these days new people come in and and then you can, you know, catch them up and with what you're doing. I mean, not really with the lesson, but with, you know, what's going on in the class. And it's not like sometimes, you know, I don't look at my attendance, if, you know, till the middle of the class sometimes. So, you know, when you see a new face, it's kind of sometimes a little bit disconcerting, right? Or, and then you, you know, I quickly get over that, but... So that's my that's my issue. Maybe nobody else has an issue with that. I don't know. Um, another thing I've done in the past. This was actually when I, we were online, and it was ver I was much more organized somehow. But even though it took a lot more time of my own time, but um, having like a <clears throat> information page so that new students you can you know if they come in. You can give them that to read, and it's just sort of a description of the class, how it, how the program works, and um, what sort of themes you're doing, and um, important dates, and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. I haven't done that for a while, but that kind of was a nice way to try to help alleviate some of the feeling of, you know, hecticness, or I don't know. Anyone else? What do you think of the revolving door? Oh, okay. I'm Claudie says I'm so used to con continuous intake. I accept it as a fact of life. Hmm. Anybody else? How do you handle it, or what does your pro? How does your program? Do, do, does your program? have a process that your manager, your admin, do they have a process how, do, how they bring intake? I know the organization that I was working for, uh, they would try to get as much communication out. And so what they would do is actually work um, with companies that say uh, hired newcomers, right? Mm -hmm. And oh. encourage them to take part in the the, um, the programs, right? And so, uh, especially for lower level learners, right? In many cases, uh, the manager um, uh, typically was bilingual or trilingual, right? And so then they would communicate it to them in their native language, and then they would make sure they signed up. Now, those situations are rare, but sometimes having access to those avenues within the community and working together with companies that are like, yes, we want our yeah. workers in these programs, right? Yeah. 
it's but it's call. it's I think that the question is more about like you're in the you're in the middle of a class you're you're it's assessment right. day <laughs> and oh yeah, there's it, a new student <laughs> you yeah. know and it happens but uh, I guess what I'm saying is especially at the beginning when the classes would start because they would have a, a beginning and then a cutoff, right? And so they would push hard at the beginning to get as oh, many I see. Yeah. people in as possible. Yeah. Right? Because they yeah. knew who the, the students were who were returning, right? And yeah, you would have... Well, yeah, but also uh, I find that like students, um, some students are like, oh no, this isn't for me or maybe they get busy or get a job yeah. so they leave. So then you have um, this, the new students come in, right? There's a few comments. Yes, this one's mm -hmm. good. Maybe implement peer support programs. Have advanced students help newcomers to the classroom with their students adjust to the program more easily since teachers can't do much with the program and uh, with the program and guide they have to follow. Mm -hmm. We had a little bit of that too, where the higher levels would have, a, say, a spouse or friends, right, that were in lower levels. They would talk to them and then they would want to take part in that. So that's yeah. interesting. And um, Paulette says, I do not like it. It throws you off sometimes. The webin webinar moderator might be a conversation to have with managers and team leads. Yeah. Um, Sorry, yes, our moderator. Good point. Yeah. Did a survey with learners, find out why they were coming to school. We were having issues with students not staying around in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. and I'm not surprised by that because think what happens oh. in the afternoon: school pick up children. Right? Yeah, but look at um, the next section, the next comment. We yeah, found, we found that, that most are coming for social connections. Right, <laughs> that makes sense too. This is true, very true. Yes, as Olivia says, very true. <laughs> All right, any more? Oh, uh, but that makes learning. Um, enjoyable absolutely yes. yes of course it, that doesn't it doesn't bother me at all <laughs> it's part of life and i'm happy if they're making social connections like you know just imagine the release that gives somebody that's new to a community and then they're just enjoying time together you know mm -hmm. For sure. All right. Shall I move to the our last question, which will take us to the breakout rooms, I believe? Sure. Okay. Yes, breakout room activity question. Okay, here we go. Thinking of ourselves and the learners we serve, how can we establish in our classroom and or program a spirit of community that might ease the anxiety and antipathy that PBLA implementation has created? Very good question. Hmm. And right. just thinking of that quote um, earlier, and then also just the idea that, um, that um, you know, two indicators of a community are um, story sharing and collaboration, and just thinking of that quote that was in the Bell Hooks book. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so Raquel, would you like to get the rooms organized for the breakout? Mm -hmm. They're ready to go. Yeah. If we need um, extra people, I know I'm here. My husband's here. If you want to throw us together in one, that's fine too. And then we can uh, split them. Say until you, if we do four, mm -hmm. five people yes. each, we can do that. I'm throwing you in. <laughs> Okay, so do you want three rooms or four? Let's do four. You can throw me okay. in. Okay. I was in number two with Tarek okay. and Howdy and Nancy. Excellent. All right. So, and what is Cloudy and Tarek are going to speak? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> uh, well, I just, uh, I was talking to Bets and... Uh, telling her and also Claudia that uh, I am a supply teacher. So uh, as a supply teacher, I'm sort of spared <laughs> the, the problems that you face about assessment. 
but uh, I was telling her that particularly about uh, creating a spirit of community that might ease anxiety, I have a kind of an advantage that I sort of uh, having come as an immigrant myself uh, about um, sort of 10 years back and then taking up this uh, profession of teaching, learning how to teach. I always loved to teach, but I had never had adopted it as a profession. I was um, a manager uh, of a non-for-profit organization in my country, which was related to spreading literacy in areas where people couldn't go to schools. So I was like a manager there. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, I can kind of relate to the, the kind of anxieties and uh, that the new immigrants come in a link program. And therefore, my experience with them has been good, that I can uh, sort of relate with them. And they seem to think that they can relate with me about how new immigrants face the problems of the language and, and how they go about it. And uh, so it's all about like creating a connection. And I do understand that communication is, I suppose, the, the best way to sort of put their anxieties to rest and create a kind of, a, of a, an atmosphere in the class which sort of makes them feel like they can open up and tell whatever they are feeling, the difficulties. And well, that's what I, I told Beth. <laughs> I thought it will remain in the room, but I had to <laughs> change it <at> all. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciated that insight. Oh, well, I you. think it's true. Thank you. And then Claudia mentioned um, that she's from the start of her career. She brought, she brings in coffee, tea, so maybe a little snack. So um, that really is a good way to nice, easy okay. way to build okay. that community. So, sorry, Beth, there's one thing that I oh, do that's, okay, sorry. That's, that's really important is that I don't let them sit in the same seat two days running. When students come in, they cannot sit in the same seat they, and they can't be with the same person. I have a really good memory. Okay. And so that means everybody has to learn to like and knew, know everybody else because I've seen too many that have been locked into uh, one <coughs> death, two people, and they yeah. don't like the people they're sitting with. So that makes everybody bonded. Uh, yeah, that's they a know really each good other. idea. Yeah. Okay, that's it. We're running low of time, so I guess we'll... Next group. <laughs> okay. Thanks, um, Scotty. I think I was thrown in group one, but I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, anyway, we were group two, so maybe go back group to one. group one. Sorry. Okay, that's okay. Um, so we talked about um, having the students involved in the decision-making process, and uh, this relates to um, if they decide to have group activities or if they prefer working independently, right? We're trying to cater to everyone. Um, There's a great idea uh, brought up about peer support networks, which is very important. Um, teaching topics um, that the students are interested in, um, and especially with lower uh, level learners, right? Uh, there's going to be uh, limitations on decision making. Um, so you like you may want to have less choices or keep it very very minimal um uh, there's also discussion about um uh, it's a good thing to start the class with a warm-up and then do like a wind down activity uh which led to uh, a discussion on the concept of uh routine um in the decision making uh process you want to keep the routine so they know what to expect and it doesn't become a surprise to them um and uh, it was also uh, mentioned that routine builds rapport and it uh, builds on uh, the students' learning because, the, like I said, they know what to expect, right? And then a good question was brought up as to does routine lead to boredom, right? Um, and in some cases it might, right? And so if that's the case, right, you might want to throw in something different as, say, like uh, a field trip, right, just to kind of like change things up, make learning more exciting, and to ease like the the stress of in this case the PBLA implementation, but you're also looking at uh, trying to have students develop social bonds, right? And so, um, if you have a field trip, right, that might be an opportunity that it gives the students a chance to get to know each other and to be more social, right? Because it's outside of that um, environment uh, of being in the classroom, right? 
Um, and another thing that was brought up too is um, it's a, like if you want to change it up, um, inviting a guest speaker, you're bringing in a new face um, and a new voice into discussion too. And obviously that will depend on the level that uh, you're teaching, right? Um, and then we kind of finalized with what was the big takeaways from the webinar in itself, right? Um, so we had um, the idea of hearing different positions, um, uh, hearing um, uh, the different experiences that teachers share and how um, uh, it can be reflected to um, like hearing different practitioners and whatnot. So yeah, that was the discussion. Pretty good. <laughs> we yeah, got good. a lot through. What about number three, room three? <laughs> Oh, I think you're muted, Daryl. You'll need to unmute. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can okay. You hear me now? Um, may you know, perhaps Sophia or Babar would like to comment. Uh, well, we were just kind of wrapping up our discussion. Actually, Daryl left us on a little bit of a cliffhanger at the end about uh, stretching and some deep breathing in the classroom um, just to get everybody uh, feeling at ease. But we kind of agreed with the consensus of everybody, just making them feel confident and making that and uniting them this thing about rotating the, the seats was a big thing that all three of us agreed on as well because oh, okay. they love that yeah yeah good 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 glad to hear that i guess room four We might have. I think um, if you can mute Cloudy, because her. So sorry. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Cloudy. If you can mute. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm coming. I just, I, I was across the room. <laughs> I was doing okay. a student thing, multitasking. Uh, yeah, so we're waiting for room four. Okay. Oh, great. So, um, as I was saying to my partner, Janine, I hope I got it right. We are about new to be, as a matter of fact. I have not been trained. I am new to everything. So it's like I'm waiting in the water. But it has been interesting. So what I have done when my students come in, um, I mix them up. So whatever your first language is, you, you don't get to sit with that person. Because the main aim is for you to speak English and also for you to get to know the other person and also to learn about the other person's culture as well. So, whenever they're doing group activity as well, I also do that. And I find that because they are so respectful students, they are eager and so um, they are willing to do that. And, and so because of that, when they ask each day, I say you need to say hello to somebody else. And they do that. Sometimes we form little circles and we play a little game of introduction and just to get, just to small talk. Yeah. Do small talk. Or yeah. the weather, the snow, do whatever it is. And they really do enjoy that. Mm -hmm. They really do enjoy that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
Excellent. Okay, so I guess that's everyone now. All right. So I want to thank uh, Beth for uh, presenting in tonight's TESOL Ontario Dialogue Series. I would also like to thank our moderator, Raquel, for providing tech support and discussion for tonight's session. And most importantly, thank you to all of the participants that took the time to participate in this discussion. Mm -hmm.